Welcome everyone to the decolonial session number 15. My name is Chris Pluch. I'm a journalist and organizer, author of Ukraine in the Crossfire and co-founder of Arales, and I will be your host for tonight. So the topic of today is how to stop the war in Ukraine, uh, a crucial topic as we uh, to address as we receive more and more disturbing news about death and destruction in the country. As you all know, Ukrainians are now suffering under an illegal and brutal invasion of Russia. And international aggression has major consequences and can lead to mass loss of human lives. We know that there were 2.4 million dead in Iraq, 1.2 million in Afghanistan and Pakistan in the US war against the Taliban. Can that kind of fate still be prevented in Ukraine? The Western response is caught in a war fever, sanctions against Russia, weapons to Ukraine and more military budgets for NATO. U.S. and European policymakers are already preparing for a protected guerrilla war, some openly talking about turning Ukraine into a new Afghanistan. Although the primary fault is clearly with the invader, Russia, the West seems eager to prolong the war indefinitely. Could diplomacy succeed and prevent such a tragic fate? In this decolonial learning session, we'll dive deeply into the origins of the eight year long war in Ukraine to debunk some of the common misconceptions about the country, from the Euromaidan movement to the relevance of radical nationalist movements, from the expansion of NATO and Russian imperialism to IMF neoliberal imposition in Ukraine. How can a balanced account of the conflict help us towards a peace accord? And what can people in the West actually do in solidarity with Ukraine? Those will be the main questions we try to answer tonight. And for that, we uh, have invited um, a truly great speaker that I admire a lot. His name is Vladimir Yushchenko. He's a research uh, associate at the Institute of East European Studies, Freie Universität Berlin. His research, research focuses on protests and social movements, revolutions, radical right and left politics, nationalism and civil society. He is the author of a number of peer-reviewed articles and interviews on contemporary Ukrainian politics, the Euromaidan uprising, and the ensuing war. Uh, he's been uh, a pro prominent contributor to major international media outlets such as The Guardian and Jacobin since 2014. And he's currently working on a collective book manuscript, The Maidan Uprising, Mobilization, Radicalization and Revolution in Ukraine, 2013 to uh, Thank you very much, Vladimir, for joining us. It's uh, it's a pleasure to have you here for this um, important topic. So before we start, just um, uh, a small remark that um, the first half of this session, about one hour, um, I will be um, having an interview directly with Vladimir. And after that, we'll open the discussion for the audience and you can ask your questions. If you wish, you can already put your questions in the chat um, so that you won't forget them uh, and we'll address them um, afterwards. Or you can, of course, just wait for the live Q&A session and uh, uh, ask him uh, directly yourself. So that's it. Um, I, will, uh, I will get straight to the, to the, to the interview. And um, before we get into the current conflict, I actually want to get into some of the history because Ukraine, of course, has been uh, at war for eight years already. A conflict that was first triggered by uh, what's called the Euromaidan revolution in 2014-2013. Uh, and the image that most Western analysts have is of a country that was universally united in a pro-Western pro revolution that kicked out a Russian-controlled despot. Um, and this is crucial for how the conflict is framed today, one of Western democracy versus Eastern de despotism, what I would consider a clear case of Orientalist framing. Uh, that is not to say that parts of the framing aren't true. There were definitely mass protests against President Yanukovych in 2014 and 13, uh, and many of them had very legitimate grievances about corruption, police violence, and repressive anti-protest laws. Uh, most of these civilians protested spontaneously, did not belong to any particular organization, and in that sense, it truly was a, a people's revolt against a repressive government on good terms with the Kremlin. But that being said, there are also a number of developments that are very seldom mentioned in the Western press, which paint a much more nuanced picture of events. And I will 
name a few of them um, uh, briefly now before I give the word to Vladimir. So first, that the EU association agreement in 2013 was tied to a harsh IMF austerity program, which was the main reason it was po postponed by President Yanukovych. Second, that the Euromaidan movement, primarily concentrated in Western and Central Ukraine, never had majority support in the country, and that Yanukovych's support base was always in the East and the South of Ukraine. Third, that the Euromaidan movement only succeeded in actually deposing Yanukovych because of a violent, radical, nationalist minority. And let me for sure emphasize that this was a minority of the protesters, but it was nevertheless quite crucial for forcing Yanukovych out, more or less, at gunpoint. Fourth, many of the organizations active in the pro-Western uprising received support from Western governments and Ukrainian oligarchs. And fifth, that after the overthrow of Yanukovych, some opposition parties, presidential candidates and media were disbanded, intimidated or assaulted, and that voter turnout in eastern and southern Ukraine after the fall of Yanukovych remained much lower than before, with many of them opting out of the political process. And finally, that the US ambassador to Ukraine was, according to um, Ukrainian media reports, giving, quote, firm orders to Ukrainian government officials on a biweekly basis, among other signs showing enormous influence of the United States in Ukrainian affairs. So again, the so-called president, pro-Russian president Yanukovych was heavily corrupt and there, were serious, there was serious police violence under his administration. To that extent, Western versions of events are generally accurate. But glorifying the other side as a heroic movement for democracy seems problematic. So considering all these facts that I just laid out, um, to what extent can we really call the Euromaidan uh, a d democratic revolution? And is this really a struggle between Western democracy and Eastern authoritarianism or something else going on? I give uh, the word to you, Vladimir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm really glad uh, to speak uh, here and thank you so much for, uh, thank you Chris for inviting me. Uh, for this uh, session. Uh, so, yeah, straight to the answer. Um, now we analyze uh, the Euromaidan revolution as uh, one of the types of contemporary revolutions. So now there is a big uh, discussion among the sociologists, uh, political scientists, where the true revolutions gone, those social revolutions which were actually uh, radically transforming the class structure, the political structure. Uh, we see actually many revolutions in the world, and not only in the post-Soviet space, but in the, uh, in the Arab countries, in, the, in African countries, in Asian countries, in the recent decades, and there are sociologists who actually count the number of uh, revolutionary changes of power, but we actually do not see the transformative revolutions. We do not see the, those revolutions that would actually bring the revolutionary changes. And uh, we analyze uh, the, we, I mean, uh, me and my colleague, Oleg Shuravlyov, Russian sociologist. Uh, so we analyze Euromaidan as a kind of like a deficient revolution. Why they're deficient? Uh, because they, uh, they truly, uh, as Chris said, uh, they truly addressed the, the problem of uh, capturing the state by a corrupt uh, clique, uh, the, the group of uh, the rich who tried to exploit the state for further enrichment. And uh, the, this crisis of political representation uh, was indeed driving most of the participants in the Euromaidan revolution. But that uh, Euromaidan revolution was deficient as in its results as well, because it was uh, those participants in the revolutions were only poorly organized. Uh, they articulated their claims very loosely on in very abstract uh, slogans like dignity, freedom, uh, nothing of specific uh, programs or specific agendas that would truly totally unite the majority of the of the participants in, in the event and so that could guide the post-revolutionary changes. Uh, there was no strong leadership within uh, the uh, the revolution and those politicians who claimed the leadership were actually deeply mistrusted by um, many of the 
participants of the event uh, at, at the street. So as a result, this uh, Euromaidan revolution that simply produced a kind of like a revolutionary legitimacy, which could be hijacked after, uh, afterwards by the various agents who could participate or support the revolution, but they were not even close to representing the interests of the majority of those who joined the Euromaidan uh, revolution. So these were, were specifically the opposition oligarchic parties, the uh, professional Western sponsored civil society, structured more like professional NGOs and uh, not really the community mobilizers, but more like think tanks, media, advocacy organizations. Uh, the, these were the radical nationalists. And this were also the, like let's say the West, the Western governments, uh, the international organizations, uh, the groups of transnational elite who also exploited the opportunities that the Euromaidan revolution created. And as a result, the uh, Euromaidan uh, trying to address and respond to the crisis of political representation and bringing masses of people to the streets and demanding some, I mean, the, the aspirations of the people were indeed uh, not simply to change Yanukovych for another oligarch, Poroshenko, but for something truly systemically transformative. But uh, they, uh, the revolution only reproduced and even intensified this crisis of political representation. So, for example, the, uh, many of Maidan participants claimed that Euromaidan finally united the diverse country, uh, East and West, Ukrainian and Russian speakers, uh, all the Ukrainian national minorities. Um, but uh, the reality was that the actual support for Euromaidan was even below 50%, according to the polls, and indeed uh, concentrated in Western and in Central regions of Ukraine with much less support in Eastern and Southern regions. And uh, claiming that the uh, revolution united the country, they uh, actually uh, started to exclude uh, that uh, large minority who did not support Euromaidan. And, uh, and that minority had very specific regional and ethno-linguistic characteristics. So the claim for a new inclusive civic nation was kind of like parallel with legitimating of specific political and ethnicized exclusions. Or in another way, the, the people, uh, protested for specific, uh, not exactly for specific, but they, they had uh, uh, expectations about uh, social change after the revolution. But that social change was, was not actually specified in, in, uh, in uh, specific programs or agendas. Uh, the mobilization in the revolution was not structured uh, according to the uh, representing the uh, interests of uh, specific social groups of Ukrainian society. And as a result of this, uh, they, uh, the Euromaidan not uh, uh, furthered, not pushed forward the social transformative agenda, uh, but only uh, empowered the narrow professionalized Western sponsored civil society who became more uh, powerful to push forward their neoliberal and nationalist agendas, which were not actually popular, even among the Euromaidan participants. And finally, the, the, the people in, in, who participated in the revolution, they were actually rejecting the political representation and such. So they were saying that, uh, we are not going to participate in the politics. They, 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 they perceive the politics as something dirty. They, they, they saw it how the oligarchs cynically exploited the political issues. And uh, this is quite a, a common perception in uh, not only Ukraine, but in the post-Soviet space, uh, but in all, I believe also in the Eastern Europe. These uh, 
distance between the common people concerns and the politics somewhere above and not really caring about the uh, about what, what ordinary people uh, are thinking and, and start struggling for. Uh, so instead of changing the politics, the, the perception was quite typical that we would rather do another revolution to change the next government. And as a result, the, uh, the, the benefits of the revolution were taken by another oligarch, Petro Poroshenko, a billionaire, uh, one of the richest people in Ukraine, who started to exploit the state for his private enrichment. And at the same time, he was uh, getting into a trap between the powerful interests of, that were strong in Ukrainian politics. So the empowered civil society, it's both its neoliberal pro-Western and nationalist wings, the other oligarchic clans with their own uh, interests, the Western powers with their own interests. And the, the result was not actually the solving the crisis of representation, but uh, pushing forward of the unpopular agendas that only intensified the perception that revolution changed nothing and uh, that uh, what, what, what else uh, uh, can we do? And the, the huge distrust toward the government, and by the end of Poroshenko's rule, actually, the Gallup uh, recorded the world uh, record low trust in the government uh, in Ukraine. So the lowest uh, among the whole world, at least those countries they polled. And that's, that's uh, now that would be not surprising that uh, Poroshenko lose the elections in 2019 to a completely newbie in, in politics, Volodymyr Zelensky, a comedian uh, with, with literally zero political experience, but uh, supported uh, primarily as, uh, as an opposite to Poroshenko. That's, that's how this uh, dynamics of the deficient revolution worked. So not really uh, solving, not really bringing more democracy, but more like intensifying the same crisis of politics in Ukraine. Thank you, Vladimir, for that uh, extensive answer. And also mentioning that this is a kind of crisis that we've seen in a lot of countries, actually, yeah. not just in Ukraine, of kind of uh, mass mobilization without clear demands and, uh, and organized grassroots leadership uh, that then can easily be co-opted by, both by local and international uh, elites. And um, But going back to Ukraine, I, I wanted to get um into one of those developments that happened uh, after the 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 Euromaidan revolution was co-opted which is namely the interim government in Ukraine uh, immediately signed an agreement with the IMF uh, even before elections had even taken place um and could you tell us a bit more about the neo neoliberal policies that were implemented uh, around that uh, time and the impact uh, they had on Ukrainian living standards um and if you one, two, I, I, I would also be happy to hear how that relates to current demands uh, among Ukrainian leftists to scrap Ukraine's foreign debts. Yeah, so th th that's, uh, that was part of the, uh, actually, the, 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 the cooptation, those uh, consequences of the revolutions that were not actually anticipated or desired by the, by the, by the uh, participants in the revolution. Uh, and... Uh, uh, in, almost immediately after the Euromaidan revolution, the uh, post-Maidan Ukrainian government signed, uh, started to cooperate with the IMF. And IMF, as it's well known, is given credits for quite specific conditions that the uh, government is supposed to implement. And in case of Ukraine, there's were a huge list of reforms. Uh, one of the most painful of them uh, was the increase or for the uh, gas, natural gas prices that uh, determined uh, how much uh, the uh, uh, regular household in Ukraine would start paying for the heating, for the warm water. And that, that has been always a super sensitive issue for uh, 
uh, Ukrainian governments and many of them were like resisting as much as they could uh, against uh, increasing the prices towards uh, the market level as uh, the IMF demanded for some of the very specific uh, neoliberal perception of how the energy market is supposed to work. Uh, and uh, this was most mostly painful to the uh, pensioners, to the older people with very low incomes and for, for whom the increase of the uh, utilities bills was quite, uh, quite painful. And th th this is actually the group of people who are very disciplined in uh, attending the elections and they have um, kind of like disproportionate power in uh, de deciding the outcomes of the elections in contrast to less politically active younger and uh, usually more affluent uh, uh, age cohorts. So uh, the, the, the energy market was one of the very painful things. One of the latest uh, uh, reforms pushed forward by the IMF was the land reform, because until very recently, I believe 2020, 2020, in 2020, I believe they voted for the land reform, uh, there was actually no uh, proper land market in Ukraine. Uh, and the idea of selling Ukrainian land uh, was hugely unpopular, like uh, over 70% in the polls were rejecting uh, the idea and especially unpopular was the idea of uh, allowing the foreigners to buy and sell the land in Ukraine. And the, uh, the problem is, of course, that the foreigners coming with big money would, would quite quickly appropriate uh, the most, the, the, the best and the biggest chunks of, of Ukrainian land so, and exploit it for their profits that they would uh, move away from Ukraine. So that would be simply an exploitation in quite a colonial style of Ukrainian raw resources. And uh, uh, actually it was not Poroshenko, it was Zelensky. Poroshenko was actually uh, resisting as much as he could to this uh, proposal. Zelensky, for some reason, he supported this reform. And, uh, but uh, despite the very unfavorable public opinion, uh, they pushed this uh, the parliament with quite many restrictions, with postponing the sale of the land to the foreigners and uh, conditioning it on some referendum that may sometimes happen, maybe after the war. But nevertheless, this is also one of the very clear uh, colonial uh, neoliberal demands uh, coming from the international organizations that the Ukrainian government was forced to implement despite the very unfavorable public opinion, uh, but uh, conditioned by the, uh, yeah, by the conditions of the financial support for Ukraine. And of course, the, 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 the issue of the debt uh, for which uh, the IMF financing was so important is, is, is crucial here, and uh, that, that's why this demand for canceling Ukrainian debt uh, has been always uh, on, on, on the top of Ukrainian left agenda, and uh, perhaps one of the very few items that actually unite quite divided Ukrainian left. Right, and I think also um, for those less familiar with the IMF, it's it's more or less a, a Western-controlled institution. Uh, voting power is uh, des decided through a one-dollar one-vote system, um, and uh, and here we see the same thing that we talked about earlier. It's not just Ukraine where this has happened. Of course, the IMF uh, has done similar agreements all over the world. Um, so again, there there are deeper um, lessons here, and uh, and um, and it also relates, of course, to broader audience debt demands um in 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 march large parts of the global south to get those scrapped as well um so ukraine very mu much fits into those demands um so we have a picture now more or less of um um of some of the earliest developments of uh, the the so-called post maidan regime um and i want to get a bit into what happens uh, next because shortly after the fall of Yanukovych, uh, Crimea, of course, held a referendum to join Russia. 
and an armed uprising started in Donbass, uh, the eastern, uh, most eastern regions of Ukraine. Uh, and again, parts of the story, as they were covered in the West, are, are generally quite accurate. For example, uh, the referendum in Crimea was held in a, a very heavily militarized environment under the watch of Russian soldiers, did not passed through the proper legal channels. Uh, secondly, that some of the occupations of government buildings in Eastern Ukraine uh, were enacted by ultranationalist Russian citizens rather than Ukrainians. Uh, third, that, the, that there has been direct Russian military involvement in two major offensives uh, in 2014 and 2015, which did help to turn the tide for the rebel forces. And finally, that the People's Republics in Luhansk and Donetsk, which, which are the two, two provinces uh, that we're talking about, are heavily financed and controlled by uh, Russia. Uh, but again, that being said, there are some uh, crucial developments that are very seldom mentioned in the Western press. Uh, I'll name again some of them. So first, uh, that the majority of the rebels were actually local, and that also the majority of the population in the rebel-held territories um, uh, seemed to support various forms of separatism. Second, that the vast majority of the people in Crimea, according to, again, various scientific surveys, uh, support uh, and, and, and did support joining Russia. Third, that the majority of weapons in the first years of the war were not actually supplied by Russia, but captured from the UK, Ukrainian armed forces and its deserters. And fourth, that in other southern and eastern regions of Ukraine, uh, polling suggests that they neither support a pro-Russian or a pro-Western course, uh, at least not until the recent invasion, which might have changed all that, but um, that even such a neutral stance could have easily got you accused of being pro-Russian, uh, inviting serious repression. So considering all these developments and also some of the local roots, um, does the excessive focus uh, over the last eight years on Russian involvement also obfuscate another important point, uh, which is that the last eight years, there has also been an internal conflict, basically a civil war within Ukraine with foreign backing on both sides of the conflict. And in that context, I also want to ask, like, do you think that the so-called pro-Russian population, as I said, a bit of a problematic term uh, of Ukraine, uh, deserves to be more widely heard and understood? Uh, there are actually uh, several groups here. Uh, so uh, the m m most of the people in Crimea, they were actually ethnic Russians. In those areas in Donbass that uh, were uh, controlled by the separatists, the most eastern parts of Donetsk and Lugansk regions, there were also like an over, a very large proportion of ethnic Russians and both Crimea and Donbass were Russian speaking regions, so overwhelmingly. Uh, that, uh, does not uh, sh that should not push us to explain this conflict in in, in a kind of like um, ethnic conflict narrative, because it, it, it was super much more complicated, and uh, the uh, major divisions were probably more like political. Uh, the different perceptions of uh, the history and how, how, how the Ukraine is supposed to relate to Russia, um, then the uh, uh, actual ethnicity or language issues. Also, the, I, I would not say that they were not unimportant at all. Um, and uh, the, uh, uh, the role of the Russian involvement, of course, in uh, Crimea annexation, it was like, very clearly a uh, Russian special operation uh, and in support uh, or maybe uh, at least partially in its instigation, the um, uh, separatist revolt in Donbass, uh, they were crucially important, of course. And now, uh, like, now many things are starting to be interpreted in retrospect as some, some kind of prelude to the full-scale invasions that started last month uh, by Russia. And so all those events would be seen now as uh, something building to the full-scale Russian invasion with some imperial goals uh, that were simply some, some first stages 
uh, to that. Uh, but of course, it, it could be possible to discuss some alternatives. What, what could the Ukrainian government do if they would start uh, to negotiate with the separatist rebels uh, when they, when they uh, started uh, the armed revolt in Donbass? Or on the contrary, if Ukraine was not so passively watching how Russia is annexing Crimea, because Ukraine was actually pushed to this passive position by the, by specifically by the United States and by the EU, who called Ukraine not to uh, uh, not to respond to the Russian provocation, not to escalate the uh, the conflict, and in retrospect, that position could also be challenged. Uh, maybe Ukraine could, I don't know, resist in some way. What 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 would be happening? Uh, what's happening in Crimea at that moment? Uh, and uh, but uh, that said, uh, those territories and those populations they were like organic pro-Russian um, attitudes, and they could be seen in in the polls uh, even before the. Uh, 2014, and, uh, in Crimea specifically, there have been for quite a long time uh, uh, an issue of separatism and support for agenda of, for, for joining uh, for joining Russia. Sometimes more popular, sometimes less popular, but that was not uh, just simply imposed. Thing, uh, the a different question is uh, about the so-called Russian. Uh, minority in uh, a, in another, in a bigger part of Ukraine, uh, without Crimea and Donbass, uh, that, uh, that was actually, uh, was pro-Russian turned into kind of like very loose and pejorative label to uh, attack the very different positions. So like, before 2014, for example, there was quite a significant camp in Ukrainian politics that really called for integrating Ukraine into Russia-led international structures, the uh, Eurasian Union, uh, the collective agreement, uh, organization of, of, of collective agreement and defense structure. And uh, Th th that positions could be called pro-Russian. There were even positions that Ukraine should become a part of the Union state with Russia and Belarus. Um, that, that is pro-Russian. But after 2014, even the positions that called for Ukraine's neutrality for being a kind of like uh, a bridge between EU and Russia for non-alignment status, uh, for the, the various discourses that challenged the dominant uh, nationalist and neoliberal narratives in Ukrainian civil society from um, so, some from the illiberal positions, uh, others from kind of like statist state development or developmentalist positions, other left wing positions, they were all blended together and called Russian because uh, first of all, because they were not something different that started to dominate that uh, uh, perception of the unified Ukraine about the unified about the Euro-Atlantic uh, course. Uh, so uh, that was very damaging for uh, understanding uh, the diversity of Ukraine, of Ukrainian politics, of Ukrainian uh, uh, cultural groups. Uh, and this problem of um, silencing and misrecognition of Ukrainian political and cultural diversity, of course, it was part of the processes that contributed uh, to the uh, to the current disaster that we are now experiencing. And of course, that, that should have been dealt very differently. Yeah, th thanks for that. And um... Uh, you, you mentioned earlier, like also the um, alternatives that might have been um, taken to to prevent the current invasion. Of course, we cannot 
uh, watch into a, a glass bowl and, and be certain about anything. Uh, but I do want to go back to the actual civil war as it was uh, going on in Donbass over the last eight years. And uh, the main narratives that were um, basically explained about it um, in the Western press. And again, I'll start with some of the things that I consider generally accurate um, and some of the things that I've been missing and then uh, wanting to hear your perspective on it. So um, what I, I think generally accurate was that during the war, uh, far right citizens continue to be active in the rebel army. Uh, and that some rebel formations have certainly committed war crimes. Uh, second, that there have been plenty of ceasefire violations by both the Ukrainian army and the rebel forces since the Minsk uh, agreements were signed. Uh, the peace agreements uh, we're talking about in that, that case in 2014 and 15. Um, but one of the key things or some of the key things that were missing uh, in this narrative is, uh, first of all, the Easter ceasefire in 2014, which, which was there before the conflict had really escalated yet into full-scale war, uh, that was violated by the far-right militia right sector with approval from the central government in Kiev, um, as its leader has openly admitted in an interview. Second, that the Minsk peace accords, which were signed by Russia, Ukraine, Germany, France, um, backed by the full weight of the UN, UN Security Council as well, uh, was quite consistently sidelined by Ukraine, who refused to implement uh, decentralized constitutional reform uh, for the autonomy of Donbass. And the agreement was very explicit that the rebels would only forfeit their territories to the Ukrainian army after the reforms had been implemented. So in that sense, the ball was uh, largely in Ukraine's court and, and they basically dropped it. Um, and finally, according to UN figures uh, that we have, uh, about 80% of, uh, so 80 of civilian casualties between 2018 and 2021, so the last years of the war before the invasion, uh, most of those were in rebel-held territory, suggesting that the Ukrainian army shelling was actually most responsible for civilian deaths in this period. So considering all these facts, before we turn to the actual current invasion, um, um, to what extent was was the Ukrainian government really interested uh, in peace? And if they weren't, uh, what, why, why not? Uh, the uh, Minsk Accords uh, were imposed on the Ukrainian government as a result of the military defeats. Uh, the first stage of the Minsk uh, Accords were after the major defeat in August 2014 uh, that was uh, inflicted uh, with the crucial participation of Russian regular forces and not simply the separatist uh, uh, formations. And uh, the second more uh, specific uh, Minsk uh, agreement in February 2015 also followed uh, major defeat of Ukrainian army in Donbass. Also, again, uh, with uh, the uh, crucial impact of Russian regular forces. So at, at that moment, it was covered, uh, uh, but uh, like it's generally uh, accepted by virtually uh, all researchers that yeah, Russian army in some or the other way was there. And uh, that was a crucial factor of Ukrainian forces defeat. So uh, by Ukrainian government, it was perceived as something like a, an imposed agreement, also mediated by uh, France and Germany. And as, uh, as it is believed, uh, with uh, a crucial input by Angela Merkel, uh, who quite contributed quite a lot to the text of, of the final Minsk Accords. So the uh, specific problem for Ukrainian government was that the uh, was, was, was specifically the issue of timing. Uh, that the, the issue that has never been solved like, during all the um, seven years. That uh, the Ukraine would take the actual control over the border with Russia. Uh, captured by the separatists uh, only after the uh, elections would be organized in the separatist called territories. Uh, that meant that uh, the, those uh, elections would be, uh, would be actually not uh, uh, 
would bring into power the people who would be preferred by Moscow. Uh, realistically understanding how those elections would be organized and that the Ukrainian parties would hardly be even allowed to participate or if participating, that would. Uh, the, the results would be quite marginal. So uh, in effect, uh, the uh, Minsk would bring the uh, Russia preferred people into the local administrations uh, of those territories in Donbass that now would be legitimized by the elections. And the Ukrainian government would now, instead of claiming that we are not going to talk with the unrecognized uh, people who, who knows who, and uh, we are not speaking to the terrorists, uh, as, as usual, many governments are saying, now they would have to, do, to, to, to deal with the uh, Russia approved uh, guys and to discuss with them the uh, actual um, substance of the autonomy status. Uh, the, that would uh, require the constitutional changes in Ukraine uh, and uh, that uh, was hugely problematic for Ukrainian government. And uh, the, uh, for the most people in the Ukrainian government, that is even more for the national liberal civil society, the Minsk Accords uh, were looking like a capitulation on Ukraine. Although that was a capitulation of a very specific uh, nation building project for Ukraine, a nation building project that would uh, see the uh, pro Russian part of Ukraine as something illegitimate, as not really a, a part uh, of Ukraine that they would need to really negotiate with and trying to build a common future about. Uh, and uh, the problem was that the uh, uh, they were rejecting uh, recognizing that they would need to start uh, talking to the, those guys that, that would need to give them at least some share of power. Uh, so if if the Minsk Accords would be implemented, the uh, uh, Donbass residents would start electing the uh, clearly pro-Russian representatives to the Ukrainian national parliament. And of course, it would be would create uh, conflictual situations. And within the discourse that was dominant after the Euromaidan, those uh, pro-Russian politicians would be clearly uh, framed as collaborationists, as traitors, uh, that uh, no way there uh, the, the could be any discussion with. And uh, for Russia, that was beneficial because that, uh, that would give them uh, some leverage, although I would disagree that the Minsk Accords would uh, kind of like fully uh, um, make Ukraine ungovernable, uh, ungovernable uh, as quite, quite many people claim, uh, because the only leverage that uh, the, uh, the separatists would get within the unified Ukraine would, would be the leverage of the institutionalized and organized secession from Ukraine. In no way they would be able, to, for example, to block uh, a decision to join NATO or to join EU. Nothing like this was uh, uh, included into the Minsk Accords, but uh, they would have some leverage. There would be some um, uh, potential for conflicts, even violence, and the Ukrainian government, uh, the civil society especially, they were uh, always claiming, and yeah, especially in the recent years, that any implementation of the Minsk Accords, uh, as they called it on Moscow terms, although that would like literally follow what, what they signed in 2015, uh, would uh, mean a, a truly civil war in Ukraine. Uh, and so in order to prevent it, uh, 
they were not going to implement the Minsk Accords. Uh, and uh, there was uh, very little of uh, uh, actual uh, attempts to think how to implement the uh, important parts of the Minsk Accords in a way that would not uh, endanger Ukrainian statehood. And I believe there, 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 there was a potential for this, and there was a potential to prevent the violence and the Ukrainian government instead of saying that they would never ever uh, agree on those terms, uh, they could rather seek for the Western government support in order to prevent a possible um, uh, violence in case of the nationalist part of society would not accept uh, the Minsk terms. And uh, the, uh, the attitudes of the population in Ukraine were also kind of like ambiguous about Minsk. So in, in 2015, the polls showed the majority support for the Minsk Accords. But when the people were saying that the Minsk is not actually working, that it's kind of like some, some kind of like senseless piece of paper that they're discussing for five, six, seven years, and there is no peace in Donbass. Uh, the level of support was, of course, declining. But I would not say that uh, for the majority of the population, uh, there was anything like like fundamentally unacceptable in the Minsk uh, clauses. Uh, it was rather a perception of their inefficiency. And uh, with more uh, active engagement with the Minsk, uh, I think Ukrainian government would, would be able to find the ways to implement uh, the accords in a way that would not uh, destroy Ukrainian statehood. The problem was that they didn't even try it. And the fundamental reason behind it, uh, there was a need to recognize that Ukraine is actually very diverse and that the, some Ukrainians want to see more like uh, closer relations to Russia, and they, they are also a part of Ukraine. Now, of course, after the full, full invasion that Russia started, uh, the potential for, for any Russia-friendly policies are closed for, for, for many, many, many years to come. And, and that's, of course, yes, it's uh, a very tragic result of all that, of very different processes that uh, led to the war. Yeah, I think tragedy is definitely the right word um, to use here. I, I had a lot of other questions, but um, uh, I want to I want to get to the to the main one because we've just gotten to the to the actual uh, invasion. Um, so I, I just want to get straight to what I think are some of the most um, important topics we need to address, uh, which is um, what the, the response of the Western governments at the moment is primarily focused on uh, arms deliveries to Ukraine, uh, higher military budgets for NATO and sanctions again against Russia. Uh, and the main question is, uh, are these actually helping? Are these actually helpful in uh, preventing uh, war in Ukraine or ending war in Ukraine? Uh, and to what extent can uh, diplomacy be uh, an alternative? Uh, I mean, the problem is this framing that actually this, uh, Many people see that uh, only diplomacy is necessary and there's no need in uh, sanctions and uh, support with the weapons of Ukrainian forces. Other people see that any diplomacy would be capitulation to Russia and uh, they need only to double down, double down and, and send more weapons and increase the sanctions up to the moment when yeah, Russia is supposed to collapse, which is not a, uh, may not be necessarily a case. Uh, so, I mean, if, at least for me, uh, it's not actually something that would uh, that is mutually exclusive. At the initial st stages of the war, you may at the same time uh, impose sanctions on the aggressor. Uh, send the weapons to the country which is under aggressions, under aggression, 
that means that the initial uh, goals and demands of Russia on Ukraine could be scaled down and could be more acceptable to Ukraine. So starting from the, as many people believe, uh, from the goal of uh, regime change in Ukraine that Putin pursued with starting the invasion. Uh, now, uh, as a result of sanctions and weapon, weapon support, uh, the demands of Russia are seemingly much more realistic, I would, I would say so. So now they uh, recognize that uh, there is no way that they would be able to remove uh, Zelensky's government from Kyiv. They retreated from uh, northern Ukraine. Uh, in, in effect, uh, like understanding that they don't have enough forces to take Kyiv, and now they perhaps are trying to concentrate the forces in order to inflict a major defeat to Ukraine in Donbass. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the things that they're negotiating right now are about the neutral status for Ukraine, which at this moment, when Ukraine sees that uh, NATO is not going to defend Ukraine, as many people were saying this before, uh, that uh, the neutral status is uh, something uh, acceptable for Ukraine. Uh, there are more like difficult things, uh, as demilitarization and uh, whatever uh, Putin accept, would accept as denazification, because it, basically it's an empty word and many things could be put, uh, put there. And of course, the most difficult uh, question uh, about recognition of Crimean annexation and uh, like effective uh, future annexation of Donbass, uh, that's, 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 that's a result of recognizing so-called independence of Donetsk and Lugansk republics. Uh, but the, 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 this, these are already the positions from which uh, the meaningful negotiations could start. And of course, the outcomes of this negotiation would be result would be decided on the battlefield. Uh, but I mean, that would work if there is also in parallel very active diplomatic brokerage of a compromise peace settlement. Yes, we increase support for Ukraine in order to. Uh, bring Putin to the earth from his imperial ambitions. Uh, but at the same time, we are actively trying to uh, broker a peace, stable peace settlement, acceptable for both Russia and Ukraine, that would bring the, uh, that would stop the war as soon as possible. If this, the, that would be a part of the Western strategy, uh, the sending of weapons and uh, sanctions would be uh, justified in my in my opinion but if uh, like for example Boris Johnson is saying that there is no even need to continue negotiations with Putin then it, it looks uh, now uh, then it looks in, in, in a quite different perspective because if you simply continue to uh, send weapons and increase sanctions, that means that you are rather interested in prolonging the war and indeed in turning Ukraine into kind of like Afghanistan and Europe with, with thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives uh, lost, with cities destroyed, with the economy bombed into pre-modern stage uh, in order to use Ukraine against Russia with some idea of perhaps bringing down Putin or even dismantling the, uh, the huge Russian state. Uh, in this perspective, this, this, this would look completely differently. But uh, in principle, I, I would not see it. Uh, sanded weapons and diplomacy as mutually exclusive. 
that's a very clear uh, and nuanced response. Um, and uh, I think uh, something very important to consider uh, for the peace movement. And I, I guess the, a, a big part um, of that decision is to push uh, our governments to not be like Boris Johnson uh, and basically um, say that no negotiations, no negotiations are needed. Um, we've been talking for almost a full hour. I uh, want to give people the chance to um, ask questions themselves directly to you. Um, people can uh, put those questions in the chat uh, or um, they can uh, turn off their uh, micro uh, turn on their microphone and uh, ask them uh, directly to you. Um, I don't see any questions yet, so I'll, I'll wait a few seconds. And um, yeah, and if people are too shy, I'm happy to just con continue with all the questions that I wasn't able to ask because you gave uh, very good and very comprehensive answers. So I didn't manage to get to all of them. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give people a few seconds now. All right, could I start with a question? Yes, go, go ahead. Okay, first of all, I want to say um, I'm, uh, I feel very sorry what's happening in Ukraine especially for the people over there. Uh, but uh, in my opinion, I think um, there's a war being fighting between America, especially, and Russia over the territory in Ukraine, over the influence in, in Ukraine, and uh, that uh, the Ukrainian people are the victims uh, of uh, this war between America and Russia about territory in the world. Um, having said that, um, I also want uh, to ask uh, you guys uh, what you exactly know about uh, Zelensky's main sponsor, uh, Igor Kolomoisky. Uh, he's a Ukrainian oligarch and Zelensky worked for him from his early days through his television station, One Plus One. Um, and also um, he announced uh, his, um, how would I say, um, uh, presidency uh, for the election through that television. And also that television, um, well, how would I say, uh, um, hosted um, advertisement uh, for uh, uh, Zelensky's election campaign. Um, I also looked up and saw that uh, from uh, Studio um, 95, if I'm correct, uh, the studio who produced uh, the series Servant of the People, where Zelensky had, was the main actor, uh, that the CEO of this studio, Parto95, I remember now, uh, is now the head of uh, secret intelligence in Ukraine. And um, the scenario writer of Servant of the People is now the first advisor of uh, President Zelensky. Um, but let's go back to Igor uh, Kolomoisky. He only, only didn't have a long connection with Zelensky. Uh, I also read through uh, Chris Lepluk, uh, investigation that Igor uh, Kolomoisky was also the end owner of Burisma. Uh, Burisma were uh, the, the son of the current president of um, America worked for Hunter Biden. And I also saw that some other American uh, board members were there in Burisma. That, and at the end, through um, the company Seneca, also um, uh, financed BioLabs in Ukraine and gave also uh, patents uh, to investigate with anthrax. Um, so uh, of course, um, Putin also said that um, uh, before, uh, I think 10 days ago about uh, Hunter's uh, Biden um, 
influence in Ukraine and what he did there. So I don't know if I could believe that that uh, America was really financing uh, weapons of mass destruction in uh, Ukraine. But I, I want to ask you guys, uh, what do you know about the influence of Igor uh, Kolomoisky on Zelensky? And um, well, uh, about maybe the people around Igor Kolomoisky. Uh, the last notice I want to say, say I also saw that uh, Igor Kolomoisky plundered uh, the Ukrainian people through his private bank. Um, I, I think uh, the question is uh, clear. Um, oh. I want to. I want to give the word to Vladimir because we also uh, need to have time for other questions. Oh. Th th yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the for the yeah. questions. I'm yeah. Sorry for the long question. It was. That's more right. Well, well, yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for the question. question. Just a uh, first remark. Uh, 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 the 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 war could be. Uh, perceived as one of the outcomes of the inter-imperialist rivalry about Ukraine. And of course, uh, NATO is not innocent in, uh, in, the, in the story of Ukraine and uh, bears some responsibility. But the primary responsibility for the start of the war is on Putin, because he, he pressed the button and he had actually other choices. Uh, even uh, con considering all the um processes uh, that uh, were connected to nato to the political developments in ukraine uh, there have been uh, other options for putin and uh, uh, if he chose the war he bears the primary responsibility also for the uh, all the, the, the horrors and loss of lives and destruction that is happening in Ukraine. Uh, returning back to Kolomoisky, uh, just to try to answer this as short as possible, uh, Kolomoisky is indeed one of the richest and the most notorious oligarchs in Ukraine that built his fortune on quite uh, outrageously. Uh, exploitation of uh, the uh, some of the selective preferences of the state that he, um, in a corrupt way, lobbied for for himself, and uh, also guilty in uh, um, moving like billions out of Ukraine into the offshore accounts and private bank was actually a part of, of, of this uh, scheme. Uh, saying that, and uh, Kolomoisky is uh, like widely hated in Ukraine. And he also has trouble with the United States, uh, I believe he, he spent for some time in Israel because he was hiding uh, from Ukrainian justice. Uh, when Zelensky won the elections, Kolomoisky indeed came back uh, to Ukraine uh, but uh, I'm saying that Kolomoisky is an actual sponsor or even kind of like a mastermind behind Zelensky would be, would be just false. Indeed, Kolomoisky supported Zelensky during the elections. Uh, and you were right uh, about the role of uh, Kolomoisky's own uh, TV channel. Uh, Kolomoisky had a huge conflict with Poroshenko and he was supporting Zelensky primarily because of this. And uh, there was a history of uh, business partnership between Zelensky and Kolomoisky, although you, you, it would be um, an exaggeration to say that Zelensky was kind of like working for Kolomoisky. Uh, there is a quite a murky story of uh, Zelensky and Kolomoisky appearing in uh, so-called Pandora papers, the papers that were published about the um, offshore companies where some of the uh, a company linked to Zelensky also appeared. And uh, I mean, that was a, uh, like a cause of quite considerable scandal that uh, decreased the support for Zelensky in Ukraine. And some uh, connections in these offshore deals with Kolomoisky could also be uh, seen in those papers. Uh, but uh, I would not say that uh, Kolomoisky is kind of like influencing 
Zelensky's policies in any significant way. Uh, Kolomoisky was not really perse persecuted for what he has done stealing from Ukraine, but he, he, he has also not, was not really uh, uh, getting out of all troubles. So uh, the, uh, Zelensky also understands that the uh, actual connections with Kolomoisky would be very toxic for him, uh, for Zelensky himself. And uh, he's not uh, trying to fully alienate Kolomoisky, but at the same time, and, and yeah, Kolomoisky sp uh, sponsored uh, parliamentary groups were important for uh, passing some of the uh, decisions for which uh, very messy Zelensky's party was not capable to mobilize uh, the majority, which they actually had in the parliament, but I mean, that, that was extremely diverse and poorly organized uh, party. So in this sense, uh, Kolomoisky was cooperating with Zelensky, but I would not say that he was kind of like um, imposing his agenda on Zelensky. I think that's a clear response. I'm going to go to some of the other questions uh, in the chat. So um, we have one question asking, uh, what about the story that was published last year in Time magazine about a plan, a plan from Eric Prince, uh, former CEO of Blackwater, I believe, to finance a private army in Ukraine? Um, and what about the role of private militias in the proxy war in the Donbass, uh, mainly Azov Battalion, Battalion on the one hand and Wagner Group uh, on the other? And actually, I think um, maybe I can throw in one more question um, there, uh, which asks, uh, can the fight of the rebels in Donbass be considered as a national liberation struggle? What is the class basis of this struggle and where do they stand ideologically? Oh no, uh, that's, that's that's just too many questions and very very different. Uh, honestly, I, I I very poorly recall that story about Eric Prince, and I'm not sure. As 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 I recall, that was uh, that was just a plan that has never been realized. Uh, why? Uh, honestly, can't say. Uh, the. Uh, the private militias, I mean, Azov is not actually a private militia. It's a very wrong um, understanding of what Azov is. Azov was created by far-right uh, activists of quite extreme background. Andriy Beletsky was the first commander of Azov. And uh, since that, uh, uh, quite soon, Azov was integrated into the National Guard structure which was um, uh, subservient to the Minister of Interior, Arsen Avakov, one of uh, the powerful Ukrainian oligarchs. But Azov should never be seen as some kind of like a private militia for Avakov. Uh, they, uh, Azov and Avakov had rather kind of like mutually beneficial relations. Uh, both politically and also in kind of like enforcement business. Uh, but even after Avakov was uh, dismissed from the minister office uh, last year, uh, Azov is, has been still doing quite well. So they, uh, uh, they, 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 they've shown themselves as like re relatively independent force. The other problem with Azov, of course, is uh, this whole far-right stuff, the use of the Wolf's, uh, Wolf's uncle symbol, uh, the start of the kind of like full-scale far-right movement with the National Corps Party, with the paramilitary organization, with all these summer camps uh, for children and so on and so forth with the international dimension, uh, creating quite extensive links with the Western far right. Uh, so 
that, that's a big st story and, and it's been covered quite extensively, even in the Western media, because they, they clearly understand that something like Azov is truly extraordinary for Europe, at least. Uh, so, uh, and the actual uh, role of Azov, I, I think it's usually exaggerated and uh, it is true that Azov is now playing an important role in uh, the defense of Mariupol, of a, a, the large uh, city in, in the southern Ukraine, which is now under like, extreme assault from the Russian forces, uh, leading to massive destruction of a city of about 500,000 people. Uh, and Azov plays an important role in defense of the city. Uh, but in the overall structure of Ukrainian forces, uh, in the, the groups of like Azov, with the far right connections, are, are not actually uh, very typical. Maybe if I can follow up on that, um, would you, what do you think of, uh, I've seen some analysis from uh, Ivan Kachanovsky uh, a few times and another Ukrainian political scientist, and I mentioned this in my book as well, that um, some of the inf influence of the far right in Ukraine is can maybe be better understood, not in their specific numbers or their support, but also in their Kind of threats um, um, that they that they sometimes um, uh, issue against the Ukrainian government, for example, when they want to do any compromise with Russia, which is kind of painted as traitors uh, and things like this. Would you consider their influence um, in this way? Do you think that they, that they have uh, that there is any real fear uh, within, for for example, Zelensky's government to compromise uh, because of a threat from the far right, or do you think that's overblown? I mean, I, I've been always writing uh, the same uh, in my own studies of Ukrainian far right and uh, post Euromaidan politics. Uh, yeah, the, many people are just stopping at the moment when they see the uh, how how few votes the nominally far right party received at the Ukrainian elections, and they say, "Well, what are you talking about? These guys." cannot get even more than 3%. Uh, so just look at uh, Le Pen or look at Hungarian Fidesz or any other large Western far-right party uh, that is actually capable to, to, to get a significant number of parliamentary seats. Uh, but of course, the uh, real power of Ukrainian far right, and that's why they were so extraordinary for Europe, that lied in, in their capacity for street mobilization, in their capacity for, uh, in their uh, uh, much stronger legitimacy within the Ukrainian civil society, and lack of any institutionalized barrier between the liberal and far right part of the civil society, which is very unusual for Western Europe, and total lack of any left wing part of active public uh, that was uh, repressed after the uh, 2014. Uh, so uh, that, uh, and also the uh, um, integration into the enforcement structures of Ukrainian state. Uh, control of the weapons, uh, uh, support of the people like Arsen Novakov uh, from the top positions of the government. That, of course, gave uh, Ukrainian far right a disproportionate influence in Ukrainian politics. And at some critical moments, they could uh, influence uh, the governmental decisions. They could push forward for, for their own agenda, as, as, as of just beginning our conversation in the, uh, from the very start. The far right were, were truly a minority among the Euromaidan participants, but they, they uh, were able to benefit a lot from the uh, from the outcomes of the Euromedan revolution and uh, push forward the uh, agendas which were not actually uh, really popular, uh, even among the participants, not speaking the total population of Ukraine. Uh, 
and death threats, uh, very explicit violence threats against the implementation of the Minsk Accords, uh, that were also part of uh, part of the story. In 2015, uh, Svoboda, um, Svoboda is a far right party uh, in Ukraine. Uh, so, an, a Svoboda activist uh, threw a hand grenade into a police line during the voting for the um, for the autonomy status for Donbas. And he killed four police officers and uh, injured, I believe, about 100. Uh, and that was already a, a very clear threat from the far right that uh, they would not allow a real progress in Minsk implementation. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the threats were repeated very explicitly in 2019 when Zelensky was uh, thinking about making some actual progress about Minsk, discussing uh, so-called Steinmeier's formula that gave some algorithm for uh, implementing the Minsk Accords. Right. It's again a, a comprehensive uh, answer. I wanna I wanna flag up one of the questions I kind of threw in earlier, uh, because I know you've written quite extensively also about uh, the the left in in or the in, in existence rather of the left uh, uh, in Ukraine and specifically also Donbas. So um, the the question was, can the fight of the rebels in Donbas be considered as a national liberation struggle? What is the class basis of this struggle, and where do they stand ideologically? That's a, that's a super complicated question. That's probably I, I missed it before. Um, I mean, the, you, you, you should start from how organic is the actual struggle for Donbass, because the armed revolt start, was started by a, a, a Russian nationalist who was a former FSB, Russian Security Service officer, retired just very recently before the war in Donbass with very clear reactionary uh, Russian nationalist monarchist agenda. Uh, he, he's, he's truly an, uh, a far-right uh, uh, ideological activist. And he, col uh, he collected, gathered uh, an armed group that currently crossed the border with Ukraine and uh, they cross the border with the arms, and that already raises a suspicion that uh, the Russian government could know a lot about uh, their plans. And of course, it's, uh, it's still not very clear to which extent uh, Igor Strelkov, that, that's uh, the name of the, of the person who started the separatist revolt, Donbass, uh, to which extent his own plans were the plans of, uh, of Kremlin, or like Putin, but there is very strong um, suspicion that he was coordinating at least with some influential people close to the government. Uh, and uh, that uh, the success of the revolt would ultimately be impossible without the uh, covered Russian support. First with weapons, then with actual portion of regular Russian forces in 2014 and in 2015. So uh, to which extent you would find here a national liberation struggle I mean, uh, national liberation struggle for, 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 for Russians in Ukraine. Um, I mean, Russia is, uh, yeah, could be considered uh, an imperialistic nation. So if you would see this in the nationalistic terms, uh, you, you, you would rather need to, uh, to look at it as a clash of nationalism, of Russian nationalism and Ukrainian nationalism. And um, yeah, at, at this moment when when Russia is uh, is waging uh, like a clear aggression in Ukraine, uh, and where, where where the Donetsk and Lugansk republics are 
clearly on Russian side against Ukraine. Uh, whether would you consider this a national liberation struggle? Uh, that's, that would be like a very extreme uh, uh, abuse of the sport. Thanks, uh, uh, Vladimir. I'm uh, wanting to round up. Um, there is one last question from Jeff. Uh, saying, um, you said that the Maidan uprising was never supported by a majority of the population, but, but if there had been a democratic outcome and compromise supported by the majority, and he's talking kind of a what if in, in 2014, uh, 13, would it still not have been a shift to the left resulting in, the, in a more liberal direction and lessening the power of the oligarchs? And regarding the pool between Russia and NATO before 2014, weren't the vast majority of Ukrainians in support of neutrality? So what, what, what the situation was basically around that time and what a democratic outcome at the time would have looked like? Of course, it's a kind of what if question, but uh, but yeah, that's uh, the last question from the audience. Um, so the Euromaidan was, uh, was not actually about NATO. It was about the association agreement with the EU. Uh, which was seen by uh, many Ukrainians as a kind of like a first step towards EU membership, although it was not. It was primarily a free trade agreement with some abstract words about corruption, democracy, and so on. Uh, but primarily this was about the free trade zone. And um, yeah, as, as, as as we actually have been saying this from the very start and as, as this has been recognized lately by by many ukrainian people in in the government in in, in business that uh, the terms of the free trade zone with the eu were not favorable for ukrainian economy for many different reasons uh, so uh, the, the uh, distribution of the uh, attitudes about EU before uh, the Euromaidan uh, protest started was uh, more like uh, more like split. It was not actually about neutrality. It was about something like 40-45 percent who supported EU integration, and about maybe 35-40 percent who supported integration with the Russia-led Eurasian. Union. At that moment, it was called Customs Union. It's Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. So uh, there was an initiative to have an actual referendum on the uh, EU uh, on, on, on the choice between EU or the Customs Union, uh, but that initiative was uh, kind of like undermined by Yanukovych government, which uh, made a huge number of mistakes uh, that resulted in toppling of Yanukovych. And uh, about NATO, before 2014, the support for NATO was actually a small minority within Ukrainian society, less than 20%. Most of Ukrainians were split uh, between those who supported a military alliance with Russia. And that sounds extremely ironic and tragic at this moment. And uh, those who were uh, supporting staying at non-alignment status for Ukraine. After the Euromaidan, uh, the support for Russia went down because of the annexation of Crimea, because of the war in Donbass. Uh, and uh, many people started to see NATO as a kind of like protection against Russia and support for NATO increased up to 40%. Uh, but until the last year, it was hardly ever above 50. So claiming the real majority within Ukraine, and we also need to understand that since 2014, the Poland companies stopped doing service in Russia next Crimea and in the separatist controlled Donbass. So that uh, pro NATO attitudes were skewed because of the exclusion of the most pro Russian regions 
in Ukraine. And so uh, uh, during the war, it's uh, just simply very difficult to organize a proper story. And it would be very interesting to know whether the, the war and the perception of NATO and how and the actual lack of support from NATO, uh, how, it's, how, it's in, how it influences the uh, attitudes of Ukrainians. Is it, is it up because of the war started by Russia? Or it's actually down because of the disappointment about NATO? Thank you um, very much, Vladimir. Um, I have to start running up now. We're exactly at time. So I want you thank you so much for, um, for joining us and um, illuminating us with all your insights, which are very important at this moment. Um, I want to thank everybody for, um, for tuning in, of course. Uh, as I said, this was the Colonial Learning Session number 15. We have one every uh, month, um, so uh, feel free to join uh, to uh, to track our agenda and uh, join for the next one. In this case, we actually, because this was a special session, we have another one coming Thursday about Dutch colonialism in Indonesia. Uh, there is a link for donations uh, in the chat. Um, we're all uh, doing this voluntarily, so uh, any uh, donations uh, are helpful.